Okay, so how do, all right, so let's start. Um, Mia, how do we think about whether we're having, whether Oscar's having a good year? I'm all in it. Okay. Um, let's take to the board here. Do we have video or no? Oh, we have the video there. Am I, am I in? Yeah. Am I in? You're all good. Okay. So I'm all in. What is MLR? Um, so each year we set a target to figure out if we can be ideally to 100. Um, so medical loss ratio is the acronym. Um, and so figuring out how we, with the premiums that are coming in, are we spending less than that or we have to go over? Okay. Um, good. So, so, so there's this notion of premiums. And then, and then what else is the other thing you're saying? Um, the spending. So is the premium money coming in, um, what our members are having to get care for? So yeah. paying for that. So medical costs. Mm -hmm. Right, and obviously we want this to go down relative to this thing. Mm -hmm. So the higher that is, relative to that, that's more cost ratio. Okay. Um, okay, so what, how else do I think about, how do I think about whether Oscar's having a good year? Um, look at it. Number base, how many numbers we have, and how much we've grown. Okay, so why, why is that important? Um, well, I think as we're trying to, I mean, a part of our mission is to you know make healthcare better for as many people as possible. So, um, like any company, we want to grow the number of customers we have. Okay, so um, right, another way to put it is if you don't have very like, um, yeah, so. That right. So the more members we have, the more that's just essentially our revenues. Exactly. Right. Is is that to a certain degree, right? Um, okay. And so, and the more members we have, the better. It's just sort of like everybody more. If your restaurant more customers is good, whatever it is, right? Um, and so, while this thing is a ratio, this thing essentially like there's this thing above here called our revenues. Um, and it's a relation to members, and then what else makes it to our revenues? Yeah, exactly. So if people pay four hundred bucks a month, right, or about five thousand bucks a year, or something like that, right? You then multiply that by the number of members we have, and boom, there you go. And so that's literally two hundred fifty thousand of these, and each one gives us four or five thousand bucks a year equals a billion chain, 1.2, 1.3 billion dollars in revenue, right? And then multiply by the medical loss, right? And that's, um, and, and that gets us how much money we make from our insurance operation. Now, anything else matter? Are you going to get your... Uh, like our administrative costs, how much we have to spend to keep the lights on. And Great. Yeah. And so I would call SG&A, selling general administrative expense. Um, and so, right, so if you get, so, and anything else, Adrian? Provide contracts, like how much it, like you'll provide a network. Great, so we'll come to, come to that in one second, so great. Um, but I think basically if you look at this, so you got, like for Oscar right now today, you got, it's about like 1.3 billion is our revenues, 2.3 million. Made up of 250k members, and you know I don't know it's something like 5k. I'm just rounding, but it's to be precise. Um, I guess that math more or less works. Um, and then you so you multiply that, and then on each member, our MLR is going to be about 84, right? Which means we make one minus that, right? Um, so you make about 16% or so on every member-ish. Um, there's an annoying thing about what you, there's different ways of accounting for MLR, and you'll hear the thing that'll get published is what's called GAP MLR, or accounting MLR, has some weird wonkiness about how it counts risk adjustment. Um, you don't have to worry about that. Um, there's also then our, our pricing or actuarial MLR. Um, tends the pricing actuarial MLR tends to be a little bit higher for the reason that we tend to be a risk adjustment payer. You know, it's a detail that you don't have to worry too much about, but just know that sometimes you hear different numbers, so I think our accounting MLR would be more like, or our pricing MLR would be more like 88, and our accounting MLR would be like 84, 83, something like that. So anyway, no big deal. Um, so let's just say we make about 16 cents 
on the dollar for every person, um, and then we have to pay out. Uh, we have to pay for us to sit in this room, for this building, for whatever taxes, fees, blah, blah, blah. Uh, broker commissions, all of that goes here. Anybody have a sense of what this is right now? What is it, do you think it's more or less than 16%? No. Why? Because I think if we're here for Oscar, we're so focused on innovation that if we're operating where we are, it, you have to have room for that too. I think all the things that we're like, looking to expand and grow, I, I don't think that we're in the negative. So I think that that's going to be less than 16 cents to also account for that portion. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I think that we might be more than 16% now, but I think that in the future we won't be because we are doing lots of things right now, like buying and getting a new office. Um, we're doing lots of things as a startup which are coming out of that pocket of money. Um, Kevin, what do you think? Sure, like <laughs> I mean, I know we're in like growth phase as a startup, so it's I mean it's okay to be like sort of in the red in the short term as a startup. Um, you want to build something where you, know, you are profitable at some point. Um, so yeah, is Oscar going to be profitable this year? No. <laughs> so Oscar's going to lose about one hundred and ten million dollars this year. So so whatever. So. Then, Mia, what does, that te what does that tell you about what SGA is? If I tell you Oscars will lose $10 million, does that tell you anything about what it, um, SGA is as a percentage of uh, revenues? Maybe it's more than that 16%. Yeah. yeah. Right. So, and I think basically it's like 250 million bucks, something like that. Um, if you add in Anyway, that's about what we spend to run the place, including broker fees, taxes, there's a lot of stuff that goes in that, um, but also everybody's salary, etc. And as Adrian's saying, that's totally normal for a startup, expected, etc. Um, that you like that's the nature of having to raise capital to make an investment in something is you go you hire those people, you build all this stuff. What we're doing right now is an investment, right? It's not technically Profitable for like in the very near term for us to spend this time educating, but we're making an investment in the future that you guys will be, you know, bud into beautiful, productive flowers, etc. <laughs> so, um, uh, anyway, um, so anyway, that's the nature of the business. So, that right now, you can break this thing, I think, is more like like 28% or something like that, something like that, or around this line. Um, and so that we lose. Maybe it may be like 26 or something like that. Um, so we, for every dollar right now, a premium, we lose 10%. Right on 4.3 billion dollars revenue is minus 100 something million dollars a year. Okay. So, so what can we do about that? That doesn't seem like so good. How are we gonna fix that? We try to increase revenue. Okay. How do we do that? I think by expanding you know, new markets, increasing membership in existing markets. So how does that solve this problem? I think it just kind of balances out your your spending, right? If we're saying we need to spend this much to kind of operate the way we want to, then we need kind of that revenue to support it. And so, right. So the, the basic principle there is that some of that SGNA, like we don't need, like for example, um, the idea of being a tech company, et cetera, is we hire 100 engineers. It's not a lot more tech work to service a million members than it is to our 50,000 or 5 million. You know, we build a tech claim system and it works. And we had to hire the people, and boy, for one member or for you know 10 million, it's the same number, it's the same claim system, right? And in essence here, you've got the notion of within this, you've got fixed and you've got variable. So every new member, well, you probably still have to pick up the phone and talk to them. Probably still have to provide services, right? Um, and you probably have to pay the taxes and fees and broker commissions, etc., customer acquisition costs. Um, but you don't need a new office, and you don't need a claim system, and you don't need this, that, and the other, right? And so the idea, and I actually don't know. I think we're going to be. This is sort of right now, like. I think it's about 12-ish, 
and this is not 14 or so. Right? And so theoretically, if we had a bazillion members, this thing can go down very fast. If you, know, you double the membership, more or less you cut this in half. Right? Whereas this has to only be, can only be improved by, by operational efficiency. Um, make sense? Okay, so um, so that gives you a bit of a sense of like literally when we think about the business at the leadership level and over the next five years, these are the levers that we're trying to pull. And, and thus when you're running your part of the business, it's important to also think about these are the levers I'm trying to help pull. So how can the stuff that we do impact our membership and revenue projections? This is sort of just what the market is more or less. Um, how can we break down MLR? And then, and then, how do we run the place efficiently? Okay. Um, and over time, the business will hopefully look like in a year or two. This, and I have to get the exact right numbers, but this will probably be more like nine percent because we get some operational efficiencies. You know, this would be more like three to four percent. Let's call it four percent. And then this whole thing would be thirteen percent or so. And then we make sixteen, and we actually hope this to get up to more like eighteen, get down to maybe two MLR. And boom, we make you know four or five percent per member on unique, a bigger membership basis. Yeah, and then we all go on vacation. <laughs> um, okay, so can I ask a question about yeah. the MLR? Where is that relative to the to our competition? Do we ever find that out? Um, yeah, I mean, our, it's about mid eighties is about what folks have basic sense of it. So why don't we, it's pretty simple, uh, simple question, what, why don't we just make that lower? Like just increase our prices and get it lower. There's some like regulatory component, right? To keep insurance, you need to sort of like have them keep right incentives, keep them honest. Like there's a limit to like how low you're in the line. Yeah, there's so the, the, that technical limit, the, the it's about 80 is the low, Lower bound, but it's actually in, in, in you can actually count some SGNA in there, so it actually is more like 75 in practice, um, or even or even 70 um, in practice. And so, anyway, that tends to not actually be the governor of how how far we go. So, um, but and in either case, it's like 80. So why are we why are we hanging out with this 84 and why that seems like we're suckers? Um, why not just get 80 or 75? Well, our pricing strategy is to be generally the lowest or second most in a market, so we can't just increase premiums. And yeah. also, I think it's really hard. To, I mean, we were not even near 80 at the beginning. Even now, there are some markets that we're not at 80. Yeah. So we have to. So obviously, the more we increase, in order to get a lower MLR, it means higher premiums, right? And higher premiums means less membership. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to always optimize those things yeah. to. To make the business work, so we, if we increase our prices, we're going to get lower revenues. Lower prices, we'll get lower, essentially lower profitability, and, and you know there we go. Um, now, um, so what are the so so what is the big so how do we actually grow our, our membership? So maybe you're saying, listen, we need to go grow, get our SGNA line, get profitable, etc. Like what are the big levers here that we can pull to do that? New markets, entry into new states. Yeah, so we can go into new markets, that's a driver here. And then new products. New markets, new products, good. Anything else we can do? We could advertise, we could market really well. <laughs> Yeah, so we could do new, essentially better or or more SGNA. Oh yeah. Of course, if we spend more per person, then that yeah, just kills our profitability, profitability, right? Okay, better, more, more sales, essentially. Mm -hmm. Anything else we can do? You can expand in existing markets by like adding counties or kind of like broadening the geography, sir. Yeah, new markets or areas. Let's say we can go. Just different geos in various ways. And else we can do? Partnerships with um, like existing companies who have a membership base, so like Humanum. 
that would be to come out? Yeah, I mean, I'll put those under, it's one version of one or the other of, we only, that's a vehicle to either get us into new products or get us into new areas, typically. So, I guess maybe put it in a different way is, um, how, um, we have the vision that we're going to go, so Oscar obviously didn't exist six years ago or whatever, um, and does it to a certain degree need to exist. Um, why, um, and yet we're sort of building this company, presumably to take market share from others, right? In other words, when we gain members, others lose members. How are we going to do that? That seems crazy. Like, in other words, like why are we united and all these folks have been around for a while? Like, literally, what are we going to do to get people to buy Oscar? Differentiate the experience. It's not about right. necessarily. It might be about products, but it's like a different. We're doing something different than Aetna than Sigma than. Okay, so we do that in a different way. Right. So if we could offer a better product, right? That's something here. Improve the product. So we'll talk about that. What that means. Well, I think this is a wild card now, but. I think at the beginning, one of the targets was individual mandate. We weren't necessarily taking patients from the other insurers. This was a pool that yeah. was perfect for us, I think. A yeah. population that needed insurance. We were now narrow, narrow network, so. Sure. So the first, that, yeah. first year, but sort of going forward, now we have that market in place. Sure. Um, so let me ask you another question. Why, um, why do we have 70,000 members in um, San Antonio and 1,000 members in Dallas. Is that the area where the contract wasn't profitable? And no, I'm sorry, that's not the The competition and the network bill. Well, I guess the most proximately thing I would say is because we're really cheap in San Antonio and we're not very cheap in Dallas. Facts, so it's not you don't know. Um, that's the that's I mean that's basically the reason is we have the cheapest plan um, in San Antonio by about ten percent, and in San Antonio in Dallas not so much. Okay, so it occurs to me that the other thing we can do is somehow lower our prices. And for all of the things on the board, so and if you would say these things are new are sort of expansion, call these things of new markets and areas are expansion, right? Expanding. And these things are all what I call like organic growth. Meaning we're in a market but we need to right. Okay. So now how do I lower my prices? Well so actually before I get there. And so anyway this one just in terms of these more sales is sort of is challenging. Like yes we could get a little bit more efficient but it's hard because if you want to spend more money on marketing, well, it just costs you more, and then it kind of like it's hard, like it's sort of just saying like be better or something. Like yes, we should sales teams should get better and better at what they do. Just like everybody should get better and better at what they do, but it's sort of you, you know it doesn't come overnight. Um, these things um, are you know some things that we can do. I mean you know that, and that's the sort of to be clear, they're all hard. It's all us getting better, but. Um, but anyway, this is the stuff I think we ultimately have to compete on is either we have a better product and it's better and better and better, or it's cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Right? Um, and the, the, then you just get my particular view and you should get it from others. My particular view is again, this is not everybody in the company views it this way, so but my particular view is that this lower in prices thing is kind of the game. In a lot of ways, because in the individual market and small group, and I think to a certain degree in Medicare Advantage, and we'll figure that out, um, it's very, very price sensitive. Right? Yeah. Um, so, anyway, so that. Um, and so, so how, do we, how do we lower prices? We just said before, like, if we lower the prices, we're just going to, you know, oppose our MLR, like, you know, so are we ever going to be able to do that? No, I think 
negotiation. Okay. So we can negotiate the next. So what is happening? So in finding a new partner, figuring out what sort of terms are appropriate, and then working to figure out, you know, based on what we expect our members to use care-wise, how can we find a network that is the most reasonably priced based on that population? So, um, got it. Um, um, so why is that good? Like, so why why does that help lower price? Make sure I get it. So you don't want to go into a market and enter into a deal with a network that may be really narrow, but is the highest price network in the game. If there is another similar network that's adequate and like appealing to members, it has lower prices. Got it. And what do you mean by higher price? <coughs> like facility and um, procedural costs. Like okay. What are they going to charge us? Percent CMS. Got it. And so, and if it's um, right, so so that essentially what you're saying is that there's a a thing called unit cost here, more or less, which drives our medical costs, which drives essentially our MLR, and the higher and if and essentially when we go pricing the market, we try to if we wanted to hit an 84 MLR, the higher the medical cost is, the higher the premium has to be, which means the lower the membership is, right? Um, Okay, so the lower that we can get on this, the better. Yep. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, got it. Um, now, anything else matter? Uh, utilization. So how can we help manage utilization or uh, just in terms of using care or not, and then also getting to the most efficient place or facility or provider? Like yeah. You have to use care. So, um, Okay, great. So now, if you think about, so then we have the game essentially. Here we go. This the game, um, the game of health insurance. Pretty simple. Is you control unit cost, you control utilization, right? That allows you to essentially lower your premiums. Um, you also have to build a good, good product. The combo of, uh, sorry, utilization and unit cost allows you to keep your premiums low. Um, that means low prices, right? Um, and then you add in a good product that builds your membership and then you just have to make sure you do that without spending too much because if you're spending way way too much to offer all these cool benefits well then I, you know you still have to make a profit essentially that's the game okay make sense question so far okay so that's what we do um, now with it and thus there is essentially one big thing okay let's make sure we have a good product all right, let's run, let's run efficiently, and then we got to manage these two things. Okay, that's the game. Those are the essential four levers that we have. Um, now, what? Um, so let's talk about about medical costs here. Um, how? Um, why? So how should we think about differentiating ourselves on medical? And within those two, are you more likely should be focusing more on unit cost differentiation or utilization differentiation? I feel like utilization is a bit closer to our control because we're able, it, we're, it's easier for us to change our members' behavior than it is for us to change our providers' behavior because, because of the size that we are as an organization. So going to a massive hospital network and saying, hey, can you start entering all of our claims on the Oscar portal? They're going to be like, you're 100 of our members. No. Like, whereas our members, we have more opportunity for them with utilization, I think. I think, uh, I, I think you kind of need to keep an eye on both, right? If you have um, a contract with a key partner in your network and you have a 10% increase this year, like that's going to rock everything and then if you see that you have a problem with like ER utilization in a market that's also something you need to address. So I think you have to kind of keep an eye on both. Um, and it, it probably varies market to market based on your membership type, like the disease burden of the membership and kind of what your deal is with the providers in that market. So great. And um, now let's say how if you were trying to pitch Oscar <laughs> to, oh, I don't know, a venture capitalist or something like that, and say, listen, we're building this great company, it's going to be amazing. You could give one or two pitches. 
build this great company. It's amazing. We're going to get the best unit costs that better than any other competitor. Or I'm building this company. It's amazing. We're going to control utilization better than anybody else. What do you think is more likely to the venture capitalist to buy into? Unicost. Why? Um, because it's the it's the easiest realization of the financial benefit. So unit cost, the, the financial, you can say the unit cost is this to this. Utilization is a lot more difficult to sell um, than unit cost, and it's more closely related to. So how do you think? Um, so how do we differentiate in negotiations versus, let's say, United Healthcare? So, in other words, this thing, unit cost, is mostly driven by rates you negotiate, right? This is driven by impacting member behavior, provider behavior, et cetera, et cetera, right? These are the basic two things, um, more or less. This is like either choosing the right doctors or negotiating, Most, mostly in negotiation, but a little bit, how do, which hospital systems, which doctors do you choose? And this one is working with them to manage care in a better way. Members and providers. So, how do we differentiate on unit costs versus United Healthcare? Since we are more of a narrow network focused company than United, that would affect the unit costs we're able to negotiate. Okay. And what about, um, let's say, Centene, who's in the same markets that we're in? How do we, how do we differentiate in unit costs versus them? Adrian, you're the, you're the uh, we should differentiate unit costs. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I saw that we're looking at is faster payment terms. So um, if you go to a provider and say you're going to get paid for a claim in 10 days, they're going to say excellent, as opposed to United, who are going to say I'll pay you when I feel like it, essentially. Kevin, what do you think about this? So for unit costs, I guess it is top um, provider experience is sort of what it's moving to that you can do small things to make it um, make I guess different health systems want to work with you more. Um, I guess going back like a level above in terms of unit cost versus utilization, I guess I was trying to think of a, an argument we can make for the utilization side. And I don't know if this is true, but maybe you could look at like sort of like the variance in unit cost, which I know is very high. Like we I'm seeing that like that one operation can cost you know ten X more in one hospital versus another. Um, or look at the variance in utilization where I know that um, like when you look across your membership, like you know, twenty percent or like a very small percentage makes up um, like a very large part of the spend. I may make that argument around like which one you can like which variance that you are are able to control. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I guess my would be my summary on these things, which is my view is it's easy to screw up unit cost, but it's hard to differentially do it better than everybody else. And no, um, it, because so you, it's very easy. We launched Oscar. If you rent a network, it's a terrible, terrible. It's easy to get a terrible deal, right? Um, uh, in other words, you know, so it's not it's not that hard to undo that and get a good market rate. To, you know, it takes a lot of work, and to be clear, like you know, it's a whole department that we're building to, to do and manage that. So it's not trivial. Um, but it's very hard to convince, let's say, you know, oh, I don't know, Hospital Corporation of America, please give us a better rate than uh, your competitor that also has the same narrow network deal. I agree from a broad network, that's good. But in the markets that we're in, it's not actually all that hard to build a narrow network. Um, you say, I'd like to do the deal, they do the deal, okay, here's the deal, whatever. And so that, um, and if you're a hospital corporation of America or something, um, if I give Oscar a better deal than an incumbent, I'm literally just like losing money on it. Because there's a certain number, and this is how these things work, is they've got 100,000 people in some town that are that are accessing their hospitals. They All they care about is, are like, if they've got that book of business, it's already on a narrow network plan, right? And then they just move it over to Oscar at a less rate. They're just making less money on the exact same people visiting their hospitals. What are they? Why would they do that? Right now, to Adrian's point, maybe you can convince them that we're going to make your life so amazing 
and we're going to lower your operational burden so much that it's worth it to give us a lower rate because you want to incentivize consumers to move over to Oscar. That's a tough putt for them because then, like, that's not something they've ever really done before. Like, that's not how the people who negotiate those deals are not the people who also do the claim settlement. Like, there's a whole lot of stuff there. So we certainly haven't yet made that, been able to make that argument all that strongly to them. Um, most, mostly, I would say. Um, we'd like to, at a certain point, an experiment, but I would call that an experiment. Uh, like, can we make this better and thus have HCA be HCA's preferred partner and give them, get a 3 to 5% discount off everything? Maybe, but that's challenging. Um, mostly, the way that it works is they say, fine, I'll give you my in-network rates. I'll give you the rates. I'll give you the rates. I give them this rate, I give them 17, I give them you, those are the rates. There's a little bit there about then how do you choose the right, like choosing the right doctors and negotiating with the right doctors and the physician community. There's a little more around network curation that goes into it. So mostly it's around decent negotiation, you know, building narrow networks, and a little bit around curation where it like choose the inexpensive doctors, not the expensive doctors, right? But mostly this is a little, it's somewhat hard to really differentiate. Um, and then utilization. Um, so like my view on that would be it's hard, it's hard but not impossible to make better um, over time, you know, and that's in essence, to my view would be a little bit of the essence of Oscar is listening to technology, we have engagement, and we're gonna use those things to, to, to do utilization better, right? That, that this will become a more of a commodity, not 100%, because there will be some things there, we have the scorecard, we have the button, but that really we're gonna leverage our member engagement and ideally your time provider engagement as well, Megan, um, to get a better utilization path. More or less, that's that's how I would say. So thus, you then have the game one level down, which is okay. Um, yes, we can make it a better product, make it a better member experience, etc. I have to tell us about the but, um, but then in this price game, we're really talking about doing unit cost in a world class way, but maybe not necessarily hanging your hat on that completely, and then using technology, consumer engagement, and the provider engagement to to lower utilization. And if we do that, I think we're going to be able to grow and, and we do it in a, in a responsible way fiscally. Um, we'll be able to grow, take over the world, and if we don't, then we probably won't. <laughs> okay. Um, now, questions at this stage. Okay. Um, now, People always seem to be talking about um, about out of network costs and sort of freaking out about those and that that's bad for us and whatever. Well, what do I mean by that? And you know, what is that? And, and how would you sort of tie that into these levers? We have no price setting there. By law, we have to treat if it's life threatening. You have to treat that member, and so we have no deal with wherever they happen to go for service. Uh -huh. So that's a variable we can't control and really hard to predict. Uh, how would that fit <coughs> into this equation? This equation is what does that mean? Um, so utilization-wise, it's it will take a lot for us to influence members in a way that if they're in a life-threatening situation, they choose our um, route of care. So if we have some things to say, do you truly need to go to an ER? Can it be an urgent care center? That sort of tiering. And then unit cost, we don't know what that is. So we can't negotiate everything out of the network. We try to with some big players in each market. Um, but that's going to obviously be a huge effect in the MLR, right? Those those medical costs that we can't negotiate if we didn't account for. Um, yeah, so the, and, and so help me understand what you mean. So let's say somebody gets hit by a bus or something like that, <coughs> and, and, or, or, or feels really deathly ill. To get their appendix out or something, um, and they—it would occur to me that they are going to need that utilization, meaning okay, appendicitis or whatever. Um, and whether they go to let's say Mount Sinai or they go to NYU, that utilization would be the same. Is the, 
Does that make sense to you or not? Yeah. It's just, does that member have the foresight to say, oh, like, I am dying, like, Mount Sinai is a network, let me go there. Right. Versus NYU, which is not a network. Right. So it occurs to me that, that there's, like, so then what, well, I guess, why do we care if they go to Mount Sinai versus NYU? Because we because have. The relations are the same. Right, but that procedure is in our negotiated rate with Mount Sinai, so we know that that's, you know, in our, our network, we've accounted for that in the cost for that member. Right, so then mostly I think out of network is a distinguishing, the issue is are we going to pay too much unit cost, right? So out of network is a question of most, basically, um, there's, there's a little bit of maybe they'll go and just languish in a hospital in NYU and they'll just keep them there forever or something like that. Um, for multiple days or something like that, which is a little bit of a utilization thing, but the bigger thing is that per procedure, we have a rate with Mount Sinai, we feel pretty good about that rate, and we don't have a rate with NYU, etc. So, um, so how does it, so, and that's thus how that impacts. So thus, the more, the less out of network care, the lower the average unit cost is, right? And it turns out, it depends exactly by market, the more, if we have 100% of the hospitals, we have very, very little out of network. Um, and, um, and if we have very few hospitals, we have more. Um, the out-of-network care, by the way, comes in two forms. What we call this pre-service and post-service. Pre-service means it's usually a network gap, where it's like, we don't have anybody with that weird procedure in our network, okay, and they give us a call, say, I can't find anybody who has weird procedure on me. And we say, well, yeah, you're kind of right, okay, here's some options out-of-network. Um, and, and they can't, go get the procedure until they get that done. Um, Post-service is we're required to pay for emergency care. And, um, and we're also required, and most of that, it's mostly that, and also called surprise bills, which is if you go for an in-network hospital, and then somebody out of network does some stuff on you, gives you anesthesia, does whatever, um, that's called a surprise bill, um, because you didn't know that that person was going to be out of network. Anyway, so emergency room and surprise bills are what's called constitute what's called post-service uh, out-of-network care. That tends to be the vast majority of the out-of-network care, so that can go from 5 to 15 to 20% of all care. Obviously, we want the lower, the lower the better. Um, and the pre-service is usually like a couple percent of care. Um, and so those are the deals. And so, okay, so your pre-service, which one do you think we get better rates on, pre-service or post-service? Pre-service. Why? Because you have time to do some sort of negotiation, perhaps? Is that? Yeah. And you can look at, oh, sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say, you can look at other options, right? Like, yeah. you can go to a couple doctors that might do that service and try to figure out what the best option is. Yeah, so get the best rate from. that's typically right. However, um, now, there's the other thing, which is, like, would you rather, um, like in, in the post service sense, they've already given the thing, they're already done, like it's done. Mm -hmm. And now they gotta come to us for the money. And so that's a different dynamic as well. Like you know, versus the first one, if you know you're the only person in town that does the thing, and you're like, listen, I'm the only person that does the thing, you're gonna need it. I'm not doing it. I'm not I'm not going to you know, you're not, not even get in the door until you agree to pay me some crazy amount of money. Like, that's a good negotiating strategy. Much worse, if you're in that position, is to have done the procedure already. Like, um, I did the procedure, and I'm the only person in town, you know, it sort of doesn't work in uh, that way. Yeah. So it depends a little bit how uh, niche or the, the um, essentially the, the leverage of the provider in the system. If they're the only one, they can still tend to drive really good pre-service. And in fact, sometimes even better, because they can say, I'm not going to do it until. Post-service is largely just determined by, frankly, the regulatory requirements. And so if the regulatory requirements, there would be nothing to say, we didn't pay anything, like, here's five bucks, see it, like, you know? Um, so it's actually much better to, for, like, in the scheme of the world, to um, to not have paid yet, um, after the, to pay until after the service is, is done and make them chase this. But what it also turns out to be is that most states, and it's very dependent state by state, make you pay more, have very ambiguous rules. It's like super weird and ambiguous, et cetera, but typically settle like around a lot more than in-network rates. 
Um, and the reason why I do that is A, because the hospital lobbies tend to be close to the state governments, but also because, and it's not totally unreasonable, to have some penalty for going out of there. Meaning, um, if there were if the same, then there would be no, there would be no reason for um, to have, you know, it, it brings a lot of power to the insurance companies, because they can say, fine, get out of the network. There's no incentive, there's no like penalty. So um, anyway, that's a whole different legislative question whether it's a good idea or bad. But anyway, that tends to be how it works. But it does very, very much by state. Michigan, pay in network rates. It's fine. So there's actually no increased cost in that number of care. That's what we think. Um, let's hope. Um, whereas Arizona, you have to pay the charges. And so and so we've got a whole lot of our operation um, was we probably spent about six or seven percent premium too much in just out of network unit costs historically. So we, that's a lot of what the network team does. Is pay um, okay. And so um, what are the things we can, okay, so anyway, that's that. Um, so, right, so then this sort of gets to how narrow networks you want to build, so I'm trying to give you a sense of leverage, but anyway, when we go and we build these narrow networks, that's one of the questions we have to wrestle with is, well, we'll, are we, we'll get better unit costs by going narrower and narrower, but we'll also have more ad network utilization. So we have to balance those things depending on the state and what the rate negotiations are, whatever that's something we have to deal with. Okay. Um, so what do we do on utilization? Case management. What does that mean? So it means um, so your example where the member goes to an out of network hospital, we would here work with that out of network hospital to identify when they actually have when they're medically able to leave the hospital so we can take them, put them in an in-network facility. So working with the doctor to make sure that they're getting the most appropriate. Why does that lower your utilization? Um, because without that intervention, that member could be languishing in that hospital for 10 days <laughs> instead of the three that are medically necessary. Yeah, so there's a certain degree. So out of network, I just want to confuse, moving people from an out of network facility to an in network facility Mostly impacting the cost. Yeah. However, um, getting people out of the hospital faster um, depends, but typically lowers utilization. Generally, the there's an interesting thing with we tend to pay hospitalizations on what's called um, like case rate for a group, rate. Um, and so for your appendix out, there's one price. Doesn't matter how many days you're in the hospital, it's just that's the price. Um, and it's sort of a bundle in that sense. Um, and so, semi-ironically, like, but usually the way the contract works is over a certain amount of days or a certain amount of cost, then we have to pay for it either per day or, or as a percentage of charges. So it's typically better if we get people out of the hospital, everybody wins the hospital, win, et cetera. Um, however, um, there's an interesting thing where, like, if you've got to go pull somebody out and then get them to a, um, like a skilled nursing facility or whatever, um, it was an ironic thing. If you pull them out on day one and they have to spend an extra 10 days in the skilled nursing facility, you actually have to pay twice. That's not a big deal. But um, okay, so but you have this sort of case management, and particularly what you're saying, I would say is discharge planning. Yeah. Okay, so that's basically getting people out of the hospital fast. That's the thing. What else? Do we do? Position incentives. What did I answer? What does that do? So, um, if you're encouraging physicians to only like encourage care that needs to be done, um, so nothing medical than necessary, then in a risk, you only agree that later they would share it up with our savings. So you're saying make sure the physicians are truly prescribing only things that have to be done for the care of this patient, nothing unnecessary. Yeah. So there's so there's two things. The things that we can do, the incentives that we get to get them done. Right, and so, so on the stuff to do, there's like, I'll, I mean, there's a whole lot of things. There's just like avoid unnecessary care. Okay, and then here, there's levers that we push on here, and provider engagement and incentives. 
is one of the ways we can do this. So we can say, we can talk, we'll talk about talk later about how you actually get behavior change on the provider side, but incentives might be one way, engagement, et cetera. Um, and then through those things, you can tell them, hey, don't do unnecessary spine surgery for people who don't need the spine surgery, or whatever. Yeah? Anything else you should be thinking about? Uh, patient engagement, the care around so far, avoiding unnecessary care, like encouraging patients to you know, call our telemedicine lines before just going to the ER. Making more of like urgent care clinics versus the ER. Yeah. So there's a thing here in terms of the stuff we do, I would call site of service. Right. So meaning do you when you're going do you go to the emergency room, do you go to urgent care? Um, or whatever it is, um, or do you do your even uh, into a certain degree of blurs and unit costs, but do you do your um, colonoscopy in the doctor's office or do you which there's no facility claim? Or do you do it in the hospital where it costs seven thousand dollars? Right? Same thing, same sort of care, or whatever. Similar if you go to the emergency room, you basically get the same care, but as the urgent care center, but like it costs, you know, another couple thousand bucks or something. Um, again, that blurs into unit costs because it's sort of utilization of well, you didn't have an emergency room visit, but it's also sort of the price for, for having somebody look at you and tell you you have the sniffles or something. Um, so there are these things that we do, and we're always looking for more stuff here that we can impact. And then there are the levers that we use to get them done. Predominantly, we engage the members and we engage the providers. Okay? And the, currently, one of the big things that we, we use member engagement for, and move fast in terms of time, is we do what's called care routing, which is um, which is, hey, listen, we're going to give you a really cool product. It's going to seem really great. You're going to want to engage with us, et cetera. And for that, you're going to, um, at the right time, we'll get you to the right site of service, whether it's telemedicine versus urgent care or urgent care versus emergency room, um, but also we'll get you to a cheaper alternative, either on the unit cost basis or on the utilization basis. Right? There's other things that we haven't done as much with this. What we should do, you could talk about incentives. Or hard steerage, use plan design, you know, that sort of stuff of like you can't go there, oh, oh, which people tend to hate. Or incentives like we'll pay you 50 bucks if you go to a cheaper MRI facility or something like that. Um, so there's a whole lot of, but anyway, when we think about, and, and then that's the same thing as providers. We can pay the providers 50 more bucks to get them to do their MRIs here versus there or whatever. So, um, and so there you go. So basically, this is then the game of Oscar, um, where we're basically doing provider engagement, member engagement, and provider engagement, using a few of these tools to impact these things in terms of utilization, while we simultaneously run an adult world-class negotiation center. Um, that impacts our medical costs, which then impacts our MRR, MRR, MLR, which allows us to lower our premiums, which then allows us to increase our revenues. And if we run responsibly, we have a great company. Simple, right? <laughs> All right. Questions before we end? Um, just on the pre service out of network negotiations, do you guys have situations where you have like a facility that's in network, but then like their neurosurgeons are out, like, and they're employed, like, take them outside of, for example, their like spine surgeon might be out of network, but the rest of the facility and physicians are in. And does that kind of change your negotiations as opposed to like the NYU spine surgeon that can do the same thing? Um, yeah, so we have, so so let's see, we definitely do have, for example, people who opt out of our Sinai contracts. We don't have every Sinai doctor that works there. We tend to basically tell Sinai, listen, you can't deliver pretty much all of your doctors and what the hell you're doing. Um, so it's only like a very few that opt out when we use our relationship to say like, no, mm -hmm. stop. Um, yeah. But there are a few, um, like kind of on a couple hands or whatever. Um, and um, and then in those cases, yeah, I don't even know if we've ever had like it's it's a sort of vanishing a small thing, but we tend in various ways to get better relation. Like the closer the people are to our core hospital systems, the more le we have more leverage and better rates. Um, mm -hmm. 
that particular case that you're saying, we haven't had a whole lot about it, network care with those folks and whatever. Or just, yeah, just like another, you know, just putting a name to it for the sake of the example. Yeah. Um, yeah. So anyway, but those are, yeah, the closer, like, obviously, if we have 10 and a half bad network care, you know, we, like, assign it, we can just give them a call and figure it out, you know, versus NYU, it's sort of, I like to sort of enter in the Death Star or something. <laughs> no, I just, I've seen that happen before. Like, you know, we have this health system in network, but the handful of physicians still opt out. And yeah, just wondering that, hap that happens. Yeah. The much bigger thing, though, is the, they employ <clears throat> group that is not employed by Sinai to do their anesthesiology, pathology, radiology, or whatever else in there, That's or there's an external like neurology group that they yeah. come work in the hospital mm -hmm. that are not owned by Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. and those are the those are the surprise bills. Like that's way what that's about a hundred times bigger than the other issue. Okay. And so that, you know, if you're in the emergency room or something like that in Sinai, they you may it's the Saturday afternoon, they may have a random like mm -hmm. neurosurgeon come in that is not employed by Matt Sinai and not contract with Oscar to do your weird, crazy brain surgery because you had a hemorrhage over the weekend or something. That is much, and, and then we get a bill for $200,000 from some other group mm -hmm. that is not owned or affiliated with Matt Sinai, and we then have to deal with that via our, our traditional out of network negotiation. Okay? All right, thank you all. Thank you.